Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're continuing our study on the kings of Judah. Uh, and we're up to Solomon this week. A uh, very in interesting character. Um, and there's a lot of, lot of weird stuff out there, I found, uh, when I was doing my preparations. There's a lot of conspiracies and all sorts of things that you'll find out there on the internet. Um, but lucky enough, we have the Bible. Okay, so um, let's start. So, what we when we commonly read about Solomon, what we recognize is two things: um, his wealth and his wisdom. You want to be healthy, want to be wealthy, want to be happy. Ask for wisdom, right? Fools despise wisdom and discipline. The, the proverbs tell us. But there's so much more to the biblical narrative of Solomon that we miss um, if we all, all we're thinking about is being healthy, wealthy, and happy. I can't turn that up anymore. No, it starts true. back before the life of Solomon with the words of the Lord through the prophet Nathan to David. Um, we'll begin our reading this morning in 2 Samuel 7. And I'm reading from verse 11 to 17. The Lord declares to you, the Lord himself will make a house for you. When your time comes and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up after you a descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one to build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be, I will be his father and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will discipline him with a rod of men and blows from mortals. But my faithful love will never leave him as it did when I removed it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. The house, your house and kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. Nathan reported all these words and this entire vision to David. Let us pray. Father, we acknowledge this morning that as always, um, we are relying on your spirit to guide us uh, through this scripture. Uh, we just pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to receive what it is that you want um, us to hear this morning. Guide me in speech um, with what you want me to say this morning. Just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Lord, through the prophet Nathan, establishes his covenant with David. David, David settled in his palace and he has peace on all sides and God gives him rest on all sides and in his heart he desires to build a house for the Lord um, a house for the ark of the Lord and while David desires this desires to build a house for the for the Lord the Lord says something to him the Lord says no you're not going to be the one who's going to who will build my house but I'll tell you something I'm going to be I will build you a house and it's interesting because we're not talking about physical houses. David already has a house. It says that he is resting in his palace. But we're talking about a dynasty. A dynasty. Um, the House of Windsor, for example, is the current, current reigning dynasty in the, in the UK. Um, and over the last 1,200 years, the UK has had over 15 different dynasties. But the Lord declares to David... He declares to David that your house and your kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. Now so much is happening in this text and it's the earliest mention of a Davidic, Davidic dynasty, an everlasting kingdom or an everlasting kingship. And when we're, when, when we're reading this, it's prophetic of what's to come with references to the immediate future of, of how Solomon is going to build the Lord's temple, but also something much uh, bigger and something, something much greater. The reason why I wanted to start here is because David will actually reaffirm this promise to his son Solomon in 1 Chronicles. And we read in, verse tw in chapter 28, verse 5 to 7, Yet the Lord God of Israel chose me out of all my family, my father's family, to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Judah as leader, and from the house of Judah, my father's family, and from my father's sons, 
he was pleased to make me king over all Israel. And out of all my sons, the Lord has given me many sons. He has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the Lord's kingdom over Israel. He said to me, your son Solomon is the one who is to build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever if he perseveres in keeping my commands and my ordinances as he is doing today. As for you, Solomon, my son, in verse 9 we read, As for you, Solomon, my son, know that God of your father, know the God of your father and serve him wholeheartedly and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands the intention of every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, he will reject you forever. Realize now that the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the, sanct for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. Now here's the promise. I will establish his kingdom forever. And the condition, if he perseveres in keeping my commands and ordinances as he's doing today. And as we continue to st our study and reading about Solomon, we'll see that the sons of, so of David will take to the thrones one by one. And over the next 400 years, one king after, the, uh, after another leads the nation into decline and defeat. Today will be, uh, I'll try my best to cover the 11 chapters of 1 Kings. Um, and we'll just be talking about the impact that, that Solomon had on the people of Judah. So, during the life of Solomon, he, the Lord appears to him on two separate occasions. And throughout scripture, we, we, we know that there is a handful of people that, that God appears to um, in one way or another. Um, and we know that they play a substantial role throughout the Bible. Adam and Eve, for example, in the garden, uh, created in God's image. Noah, who was to build an ark to save his family and two of every kind of living, an of every living creature. Abraham. Uh, who God appeared to, the father of many nations. Moses, who God appeared to by a burning bush. Paul and the disciples um, who walked and were taught um, by Jesus himself. But on two separate occasions, we know the Lord appeared to Solomon. And what kind of impact does Solomon have as a king? What kind of immediate impact did he have on those around him? What lessons can we observe in the life of Solomon. Now we'll be following the account of 1 Kings starting in chapter 1. And the story starts by describing the later days of David. The last days of David. Um, it starts off by saying that David was very old in his, in, his, in his age. Advanced in his age. And he had a condition where he couldn't keep warm. Or he couldn't regulate his temperature. Um, and later on we'll get a sense that in his old age. David was losing the awareness in his, in his kingdom and presence in his kingdom, perhaps due to his physical condition. Now, it's at this point um, that we read about Adonijah's bid for power. The fourth son of David, uh, the eldest surviving son after the death of Absalom. Um, and Adonijah knows that his, his father's weak and that, the day, his, that his last days are, are near. So he kept exalting himself, chapter 1 tells us. I will be king, he says. He prepared chariots of men to run before him, parading himself around um, as the son of David, who was to be next in line for the throne. And, uh, and according to the cultural context at the time, some would say, why not? He's the eldest. Not only is he, is he the eldest remaining son, but the author also includes something um, here that we read in verse 6. He was very good looking. An, ap an attribute it would seem that is suitable for a king. If you remember Saul, according to the New King James Version, was a choice and handsome young man. David had bright eyes and was good looking. Now there's nothing wrong with being handsome. But the text is there for a reason, I believe. Men have the tendency to follow what's appealing to the eyes and the culture. John tells us in 1 John. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father, 
but from the world. God hasn't chosen Adonijah to be king. In time, Adonijah's bid for power is unsuccessful. And when David's informed by Nathan and Bathsheba in verse 20 and 21, we read, And as for you, O Lord, O King, the eyes of Israel are on you, that you should tell them who will sit on the throne of my Lord, the King, after him. Otherwise, it will happen when the Lord, the King, rests with, the, with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be counted as offenders. Now, it's not that Bathsheba and Solomon have done anything wrong or, or, or something to be offenders. Um, but it was common practice at the time uh, that one might eliminate any potential threats that might want to take the throne. Um, a common practice for many kings, uh, especially one's own family members. And we'll later find out that Solomon himself will go on to carry this practice out. Now, reading on, in verse 28, uh, to 30, then King David answered and, and said, call Bathsheba to me. So she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king took an oath and said, as the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from every distress, just as I swore to you by the Lord God of Israel, saying, assuredly, Solomon, your son, will be king after me. And he shall sit on my throne in the place, in my place. So certainly will I do this day. And here we can see the promise of God to David through the prophet Nathan in action. A promise of his descendant who will build a house for the name of the Lord. The one who will continue on the everlasting throne of the house of David. And what follows is the confirmation of Solomon as king by the authority of David. Verse 33, the king also said to them, take with you the servants of the Lord and have Solomon ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There let Zadok the priest and, the Na and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. And blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him. And he shall come and sit on my throne. And he shall be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Now, the son of David rides through Jerusalem on a mule reserved for the king. And he's anointed at Gihon, uh, translated to burst forth or gushing. A spring of water just outside the walls of Jerusalem, which is symbolic in the time of, of life and cleansing. And then he's seated on the king's throne. The ram's horn is sounded and the people are rejoicing greatly. So much that the text says the earth split open from the sound. Now, whether the earth burst open from their joyful sound or whether the earth shook with their joyful sound, we know that they were rejoicing. Now, Adonijah in fear hears about this. Him and his guests disperse. Um, and he's brought before Solomon. And Solomon sends him home. Now, the people rejoice greatly. In verse 47... It says, may God make the name of Solomon more greatly known than the name of David. So, the mood of the text is that Solomon's just been made king. The people are rejoicing. They're really happy, happy days. God has given us another king. Hopefully he's better than the last guy. The people recognize the authority of Solomon's coronation. And are rejoicing because here is what here we have a king to sit upon the throne of Israel and to carry out the achievements that they experienced under David's reign, maybe even better. To fulfill everything the Lord had promised David, who before the, or, the eyes of all Israel has entrusted to Solomon. Surely there's much to be expected. A great kingdom, perhaps a great king. Now moving on to chapter 2. We start off by reading David's final exhortations to, to David and his instructions and warnings for, for those who oppose the throne. Now Adonijah was spared judgment by Solomon who still, and then he's still trying to, to get into a position of power. Verse 15. You know the kingship was mine, he said. All Israel expected me to be king. 
But then the kingship was turned over to my brother, for the Lord gave it to him. So now I have just one request, he says to Bathsheba. Don't turn me down. In verse 17, he says, Please ask King Solomon, since he won't turn you down, let him give me Abishag the Shunammite as a wife. And we know Abishag is the young woman who tended to David in his last days. Um, and what Adonai is trying to do here um, is a political attempt to gain a position of power. Um, if he's to marry the, uh, David's, um, David's attendee, then, then the people would recognize him as someone who, who might uh, lead them. And it's here, and it's here that we see that Solomon starts to clean house. He's infu infuriated with the request of Adonijah. And one by one, his political oppositions are eliminated. Abiathar is banished from priesthood. Joab is executed. Shimei is tested by Solomon. Um, due to the warnings of his father David, and he's allowed to live within the confines of Jerusalem. And if he leaves, he's be to be executed. And, and we read later on that he pursues his, his servants out of Jerusalem, and when Solomon finds out, he's, he's struck down. But verse 46 brings the chapter to a conclusion um, with the elimination of the troublemakers by the hand of Solomon and not by the hand of the Lord. It reads, Then the king commanded Benaiah son of Jehoiada, and he went and struck Shimei down, and he died. So the kingdom was established in Solomon's hand. Now, David's advice to Solomon may be similar to, what, to, to a wise king giving instructions to, ex, to his successors. But the fact seems to be that David is instructing Solomon to kill the people who pose the threat to his kingdom. Such an action would help Solomon to ensure his rule would be secure. In his evaluation of David's advice to Solomon, Marvin Sweeney in his commentary wrote, David's testament to Solomon indicates that the dynasty was corrupt at its very foundation. It portrays a private side to David and Solomon that contrasts the off-stated portrayal of David's righteousness and, f and fidelity to Yahweh and Solomon's reputation for great wisdom. Now, though Solomon was chosen by God, the story of Solomon and Adonijah display the efforts of men in their claim and pursuit to power. Solomon, by eliminating his oppositions, killing them, and Adonijah by self-exaltation. Now, chapter 3 is the first time that the Lord appears to, uh, to Solomon. And we know that at the time, the people were sacrificing in the high places, um, which is a common practice among the pagans, uh, where they would try to get up high to reach the gods. Um, and we know that the Lord appears to David in a dream for the first time. And this is a part of the story that we're all familiar with. And he asks David, he asks David, sorry, at Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night. God said, ask what you should. Ask, what should I give you? And Solomon replied, You have shown great, great and faithful love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, righteousness, and integrity. You have continued this great and faithful love for him by giving him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. Lord my God, you have made your servant king in my father David's place. Yet I am just a youth with no experience in leadership. Your servant is among your people, and you have chosen a people too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant a receptive heart to judge your people. 
and to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great nation, this great people of yours? Now, this is the part that we are all familiar with. And we can't overlook the importance of what Solomon has asked for here. And why it's pleased the Lord that he would request such a thing. And while, yes, he didn't ask for riches, he didn't ask for long life or the death of his enemies, but a receptive heart to judge and discern between good and evil. And what we're seeing here is that Solomon is seeking the will of God. Where Adam and Eve failed, Solomon pleased God with his request. He's pulled his hand away from the tree as to say, I trust you, Lord, to show me what is good and is evil. And he's asked the Lord to give him a discerning heart to discern between good and evil. Now, each of us are faced with this reality each day. And the wisdom of God is available to, available to us to discern good from evil. The question is, will we decide to define for ourselves or trust God to? Now, we, we read on. In verse 10, the story of two mothers and a baby. This, this, this dispute about who the mother of the living child is. Now, it's obvious from the narrative that, uh, that one of the women are lying. And the wisdom of God in Solomon is displayed for all to see. It was God who made women mothers. And it's the love of God that's reflected in a mother that shows here. Verse 24 to 28. The king continued, bring a sword. So they brought the sword to the king. And the king said, cut the living boy in two and give half to the one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive spoke to the king because she felt great compassion for her son. My lord, give her the living baby, she said, but please don't have him killed. We read on in verse 28, all Israel heard about the judgment the king had given and they stood in awe of the king because what he has said because what they saw that God's wisdom was with him in him to carry out justice now why are the people in awe here we see the impact that the God is able to carry out through Solomon the people stand in awe they recognize the wisdom of God that is shown in Solomon Romans 11, verse 33, O oh, the depths and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out. It's notable that this is the way God intended it to be from the beginning. For man to rely on the wisdom of God. And since the fall, mankind has been acting on our own wisdom. Romans 8 talks about creation, that creation groans, that we await restoration. Men stand in awe of God's wisdom. Now, before we carry on to the, the wealth and the provisions of, of Solomon, um, I think it's, that it's important that we start uh, at the temple. Um, one of the promises that the Lord uh, said was that Solomon... The son of David was to be the one to build his house. Now, one of Solomon's great achievements is building the Lord's temple. And in chapter 5 and 6, it describes the imports and the exports of the resources between Hiram, and Tyre, Hiram of Tyre and Sidon and Solomon and the construction of the Lord's temple. Before the construction of the temple, people worshipped at the tent of meeting. And we know this from chapter 3, that the people, including Solomon, were sacrificing on the high places. After seven years, Solomon completed the construction of the temple. We read about the dedication of the temple in, chapters, in chapter 8, verse 1 to 10. And Solomon's prayer and blessing, a petition to the Lord. May this temple be what you promised my father David, an acknowledgement that the Lord would dwell in the temple. And it would become a, t a place of worship and a refuge. 
The temple built into, in Jerusalem by Solomon ushered in a new period of Israelite worship, bringing the 12 tribes together as one who worshipped God in one place. Now, the wealth and prosperity of Solomon. Now, God promised Solomon riches, wisdom, and honor. And sure enough, as we read, Solomon was wiser than all the people of the East, wiser than all the people of Egypt. Under Solomon, in chapter 4, verse 20, says, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea, and were eating and drinking and rejoicing. Now, life is good. They have a wise king. Everyone wants an audience with the king. Emissaries of all people sent by every king on earth who had heard of his wisdom came to listen to Solomon. From Dan to Beersheba, under the, each under his own vine and his own fig tree. Describing the freedom and independence of God's people that they enjoy under his rule. Now this is the same phrase used in Micah with his prophecy of the Lord and his reign that's to come over Zion in the later days. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Now the people of Israel experienced great prosperity and freedom. And on the surface we read about the provisions and the wealth of Solomon and the resources and the gold and the exotic animals imported to Israel. Surely the, the promises of God are being fulfilled in Solomon and the people of Israel. Ask for wisdom and you get wealth, health and happiness. But it's here that we start to see a shift in the narrative. Jesus pronounces woes. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all, when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. Now it isn't saying that there is something innately evil about being rich or well-fed, or having people saying nice things about you. But the woes that Jesus is saying here are for those who do these things in a way that break covenant with God. And as we read through First Kings, we'll start to get hints of questionable things that the Israelites did, and also Solomon. They had become those who were rich. They'd become those who were full. They were full of laughter. They were recognized among the nations. The Lord had fulfilled his promise to Solomon, but what we see in their quest to establishing a great kingdom is that they start to lose their way. Questionable action number one, the wedding dowry in chapter nine. Now, We know from chapter 3 that Solomon had a political marriage with the daughter of Pharaoh. And in chapter 9, verse 16, it says, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had attacked and captured Gezer. And then he burnt it, killed the Canaanites who lived in the city, and gave it as a dowry to his daughter. What a wedding gift. Number 2, Solomon's forced labor. As for all the people, in verse 20 of chapter 9, as for all the people who remained of the Amorites, the Hethites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not Israelite, their descendants who remained in the land after them, those whom the Israelites were unable to destroy, and com destroy completely, Solomon imposed forced labor on them. It is still this way today. Now, here we see the people of Israel, a people who cried out to God in Egypt to deliver them from their, from their oppressors, a people who God then delivers from Israel, from the hand of their oppressors. And in their attempt to establish their kingdom, they've gone and done the same thing to those around them. Now, Solomon's wealth. Verse 14, 
The weight of gold that came to Solomon annually was 25 tons. Beside that came from beside what came from merchants, traders, merchandise, and all the Arabian kings and governors of the land. Verse 23. King Solomon surpassed all the kings of the world in riches and in wisdom. The whole, the whole world wanted, to, wanted an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. Verse 26. Solomon accumulated 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen and stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. Verse 28. Solomon's horses were imported from Egypt and from Que. The king's traders brought them from Que at a going price. The chariot was imported from Egypt for 15 pounds of silver and the horse for nearly four pounds. Now, Barry covered a verse last week um, when he covered David that while I was listening to it, it screamed Solomon at me. Um, and it will... The text will leap off the page. Um, Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. And God is telling his people, is this his command to his people when they, what they should do when they have a king, when they establish a king over themselves. So Deuteronomy 17, verse 16. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Now what the verse then goes on, goes on to say is that the king is to write for himself a copy of the law and he's meant to read it all the days of his life. And he's, he's to learn to fear the Lord and to be careful to observe these words. Now, Solomon didn't do these things. If we read back in Deuteronomy again, he caused the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. He accumulated gold for himself. He accumulated many wives for himself, as we read on in verse 11. And we read on in verse 11 that in his later days, they turned his heart away from the Lord. Good. Now, now the unfaithfulness of Solomon starts with his disobedience to God. And here we read that King Solomon loved many foreign women in addition to Pharaoh's daughter. And this angered the Lord. And what we see here is that Solomon did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And unlike his father David, he did not remain loyal to the Lord. At the time, he built a high place for, the, for Chemosh, the abhorrent idol of Moab, and for Milcom, the abhorrent idol of the Ammonites, and on the hill across from Jerusalem. He did the same for all his foreign wives who were burning incense and offering sacrifices to their God. The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Now, this then led to the dividing of the kingdom. God says that since you have done this and did not keep my covenant and statues, which I commanded you, I will tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. However, I will not do this during your lifetime for the sake of of your father David. I will tear it out of your son's hand. Finally, in verse 42 of chapter 11, the length of Solomon's reign in Jerusalem over Israel t totaled 40 years. Solomon rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of his father David. Now, was Solomon a good king or a bad king? For those at the time, he was a great king. In fact, there was no king greater in his lifetime. But God wants a king who walks in his statutes and ordinances, who keeps his commands, 
one who would bring an everlasting kingdom, and it would seem that person was not Solomon. Though he was the one to build the temple, he wasn't able to walk in full obedience to the Lord. However, the Lord hasn't broken his promise to the house of David. Eventually, this was fulfilled by Christ, who was obedient to the point of death and will reign on a throne that endures forever. Now, Solomon had an impact on the people of Israel and Judah. And he failed through his disobedience. Proverbs tell us, tells us that the wisdom, of God, the wisdom comes from God. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We have, this, this, we have the discernment of God available to us through his word and his spirit living in us. James calls us to be doers of the word. Jesus said in Matthew 7 verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these, things, these sayings of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now wisdom comes when we hear God's word and apply his truth in our life. When we actually do what we hear, wisdom is the result. The wisdom guards our life by the power and the grace that comes from God alone. And it's up to us to decide what kind of impact we will leave. Thank you.